Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Centre for Palliative Care's annual lecture for 2021. It's my great privilege to be the facilitator of our session today, Paramedicine, the Evolving Opportunity of Palliative Care Paramedicine. I'm Mark Bowie. I'm the Director of Palliative Medicine at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, and also Deputy Director of the Centre for Palliative Care. I'm often somebody who says very much in palliative care that one needs to recognise need or recognition is the important factor that then leads to appropriate response. And I think today we've got three pioneers who are leading in Australia the, that look of understanding what the recognition of the connection of paramedicine to palliative care is and are enacting and trying to influence change and bringing about change with paramedicine to actually be responding in, in an appropriate way as well. So it's terrific that you from across uh, Australia and beyond and also our speakers joining us here today. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Centre for Palliative Care I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to our land, sea and community. We indeed pay our sincere respects to their elders, past, present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and in fact, other First Nations people who might be represented from other countries uh, joining us here today. So welcome. It's always an exciting time bringing the, bringing the annual lecture to fruition every year. And as we have in previous year, this is coming to you obviously across uh, a telehealth sort of platform instead of face to face and in person. We have three speaker or three people who are joining us today, and I will introduce uh, Alan Ede um, first up, as he'll be speaking to you directly and, and presenting his um, work with you. And then we'll have a after that we'll have an opportunity to have a panel discussion with Brendan and Andrew. Their CVs per se are in the notes that have been filtered. To you, but I really just want to take the opportunity to introduce Alan at the beginning. Alan, as you can see from his CV, is the Chief Paramedic Officer for Safer Care Victoria, which is really the quality and improvement arm of uh, the Department of Health within uh, the state of Victoria. I've known Alan for a few years now as I represented the clinical leadership role for the Palliative Care Network in Victoria, but over the last six months, 12 months, it's been He's been an influential and an important person to be connected to work in this very space. He's got a, a great background in not only leadership roles, but also in connections to um, Monash University and continues to advocate very strongly for uh, the connections between and the evolution of paramedicine in the clinical space. So welcome, Alan. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. and. Um, give you the opportunity to speak and present. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark, and um, greetings to everybody. It's um, humbling to have a paramedic delivering the um, uh, Centre for Palliative Care's annual lecture. And uh, uh, I'm so privileged to be joined by Brendan and Andrew um, uh, in bringing uh, forward um, something that might be uh, either considered unusual or um, uh, that people hadn't considered. Um, in terms of um, the provision of palliative care. Um, so I'm going to join with Mark and uh, my colleagues and I'm going to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we're all meeting uh, and where we're coming to this particular event from. Uh, pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, the images uh, and the material that's in the presentation are available from uh, um, online um, and uh, um, so uh, if you feel free, that feel the need to steal any of those images, I stole them from Google. Um, so, um, uh, and the attribution is in the speaker's notes. Um, I thought I'd just start with how we got to um, where we are. There's lots of different perceptions about paramedicine. And in 1967, we had these two, Johnny and Roy from Squad 51. They hit our screens um, uh, from the hit TV show, Emergency. And they were a reflection of the current state of, state of paramedicine or paramedic practice as it was in the United States. The scope of practice throughout the, what, the seven years of change that was occurring 
um, across the pre-hospital space um, in, the, in the US at the time. The 70s um, uh, didn't just have wide pants. Um, the 70s uh, care at the, in, in the 1970s um, from a paramedic point of view was quite basic. In fact, most paramedics were referred to as ambulance officers or ambulance attendants. Um, patients got carried everywhere um, and uh, um, the majority of the uh, interventions involved much what we would refer to today as first aid. Cardiac arrest survival was quite rare. And specifically for this image, um, not all uh, ambulance services were operated by government. Uh, ambulance services were, uh, in, um, were operated on, on occasion by um, uh, non-government entities. Um, in the 1980s, um, uh, there was a time, yes, before mobile phones, um, uh, um, and the 1980s was it, um, but defibrillators were only introduced into um, the ambulance service practice in the, in the mid-1980s. There was an increasing availability of medicines and uh, a growing understanding of paramedic-delivered critical care um, uh, that was evolving um, uh, across um, uh, Australasia. The 90s, pre-hospital care really started to find its feet in the 1990s um, uh, and there was a challenge to the paramedic um, psyche during the 1990s as education moved from its TAFE or its uh, on-site or within service and within employment learning opportunity through to the university sector um, and we saw the, the, the migration of um, paramedic education into the tertiary space. With that increase in education, there was um, an increase in standards and responsibility and the skills and scope of practice for the paramedics evolved as well. This was also the period where we started to see equipment being tailored specifically for its operation in the pre-hospital environment being developed. 2000s um, and university education takes over completely from um, our TAFE or our, our within employment um, uh, education mo uh, modalities. Paramedic research starts to um, uh, and gain a foothold and uh, develop quite well. Um, and uh, um, sadly, it took quite a long time, but uh, 2000s where we started to see our gender diversity improve um, uh, across our emergency ambulance sector as well. In the 2010s, um, uh, paramedic research really starts to make its mark, um, not only just in the paramedic and out of hospital literature, but in the medical literature space as well. Um, some very large trials that were driven out of the pre-hospital or the um, out of hospital um, arena have had an impact. So if I use things like the AVOID study or the AVOID trial, which is oxygen in um, ischemic chest pain, um, uh, that, that particular study undertaken in an out of hospital context um, uh, um, has gone on to shift um, uh, guidance around uh, the management of um, ischemic chest pain um, worldwide. Um, we also saw the migration of um, our um, uh, paramedic-based care away from traditional emergency ambulance environments um, into um, private um, and uh, event medical spaces. I suppose the biggest thing that uh, um, people might find unusual is that paramedics weren't a registered health profession until 2018. Um, so whilst nursing and medicine and, um, and many other disciplines have had um, registration under the Australian, Australian Health Practitioners Registration Agency, um, uh, um, if there was an emergency in a small health service or in the community, the unregistered health practitioners would be summoned to support uh, the, the patient in their most critical time of need. Um, and then convey them to another registered health pro um, uh, provider. It was an anomaly which um, took a very long time to correct, but thankfully in 2018, um, uh, the paramedic workforce, on the back of their migration through the years, has um, uh, moved on to um, join the rest of the um, uh, rest of its colleagues and be registered. But some of the things that haven't shifted um, uh, over the period of time is the model of care, and it really has been the same since Napoleon. Um, the, uh, we've been sending two people with a stretcher out to deliver services um, uh, for eons uh, and it's almost never been challenged. Um, right up until today, the, the model that we use to deliver services in an ambulance entity right, is um, two people and a truck. Um, now, we have stretchers that have got wheels and they may be electric and they lift themselves up and all these things have improved, but we're still sending that same service model out into the community to deal with emergencies. 
The patient assessment model has, however, evolved. That first aid approach, which we was, that which began in the 70s, um, has migrated now. And the undergraduate education of paramedics across the board follows a, a, a medical, um, what most would understand to be a medical model of patient assessment. It's holistic. It takes into account the biopsychosocial needs of the individual, um, and it is very much more detailed than what we've seen, pre uh, what was um, previously the case. So, in terms of the future, um, well. We're actually sort of into the future now, and paramedics are working in healthcare. They're working in roles that um, uh, didn't exist one or even four or five years ago. They're working in places that uh, are not an ambulance service. They're working in environments that uh, have been traditionally undertaken by other practitioners of healthcare. Um, as more um, staff have been needed for places, uh, for, the, for the performance of those skills. If I use the pandemic as an example, Contact tracing and um, uh, testing and vaccination centres are just one, uh, or just just a couple of those environments where pay paramedics are now um, actively engaged. We've also got, had a great opportunity to learn from each other, and um, uh, we have paramedics working, uh, emergency-based um, paramedics coming across paramedics who are working in the private or the event space, not infrequently. It's a bit of a shift for the um, identity of um, uh, the paramedic workforce. It hasn't been easy in some cases um, for them to get used to the concept that a paramedic can exist beyond the walls, if you like, of an emergency ambulance service. Because historically, that's been where everybody sees it. Paramedic equals ambulance service. Um, but increasingly, that isn't the case. So traditional models of care are not only about life-threatening emergencies, but, in, but, but the evolution of our education in the paramedic space has been in, re in response to the work that is actually done in an emergency ambulance setting on a daily basis. And it may surprise many people to realise that within the emergency ambulance context, um, the vast majority of the work would probably be better defined as primary care. Right? Ambulance um, activity or emergency ambulance activity increasingly is primary care with the occasional emergency thrown in not the other way around. Um, and uh, so the education within the paramedic, uh, paramedicine programs has moved now to support the, the work that is required to be undertaken. And that means making sure that people have the ability to ass assess and manage chronic disease, manage primary care presentations, and deal with an ever expanding um, a range of concerns that are largely driven by mental health. Extended care um, paramedic platforms exist um, within Australasia um, and internationally. Um, and whilst uh, there's no definition, of, you know, no, no agreement on that particular title, the, um, there's a range of opportunities where paramedics have become specialists or chosen to specialise. Um, and these, um, these practitioner models um, are well advanced, um, in, uh, not only in Australia, but um, overseas, particularly the United Kingdom. Um, we have community paramedics that are born in, uh, out of the, the North American model um, and expanding also um, um, internationally right, that are uh, focused largely on primary care, health protection, health prevention. Um, but across all of these particular titles and type role descriptions that have evolved, one aspect of care has constantly been brought forward as a gap in the health system that could be addressed and um, undertaken um, and assisted by these particular paramedic models. And largely, uh, sorry, and that is palliative care. Extended care practitioner models have continued to evolve um, and uh, I would expect that is only going to continue to be the case. We have paramedics now working in corrections. We have paramedics working in um, uh, prim as primary mental health um, clinicians. We have paramedics working in um, uh, um, primary care through um, be that our medical clinics or being community um, uh, health centres and health services. An integrated model of care has been shown throughout all of those environments to be successful, to bring a, um, to coalesce a range of different skill sets, which brings the optimum uh, opportunity for care of people in whatever context that they're being deployed. It's also elevated the opportunity for paramedics to utilise 
telehealth and to um, engage in referral of care um, uh, away from, in many cases, and what would traditionally have been considered the normal destination being a hospital. I've mentioned the event medical space. Private industrial and event medical coverage is probably the largest employer of paramedics um, outside of emergency ambulance services currently. But increasingly we're seeing uh, that move towards the community health sector. Um, and in all of these particular models, there isn't a transport component. The provision of care is undertaken at the place the patient is um, attended to, whether that be an event or whether that be in a community setting. Um, and no longer is a paramedic um, attendance um, instantly a pre-hospital attendance, with the inference being that all paramedic patient, patients treated by paramedics go to hospital. Increasingly, um, they are referring people away from health services, uh, and that is diluting um, uh, patients that are entering the health system, either spatially or temporally. We also have paramedics working within health services and they are uh, undertaking um, critical care transfers, not just between health services, but even between, even within one. So from ED to the operating suite or to the um, uh, to radiology or the cath lab, um, etc. So models of care are changing. Um, traditional roles are changing. Emergency ambulance is not the only approach to paramedic practice and transport is no longer a fundamental feature of paramedicine. Right? So I've just bashed a whole heap of known tenants and um, uh, I'm sorry about that. Just because things are changing doesn't make them wrong, but we also have to make sure that we're not just changing for the sake of it and that what we are doing is actually making a difference and making things better. Throughout this, I've used the word referral, and I've used that deliberately because no one health provider can do all of the provision of care that an individual will need for their for their community for their long term community needs. It is always going to involve other parties and other players, and paramedicine is absolutely no different. Uh, whilst the uh, historical construct of an emergency ambulance service has been very independent. The new model of care in paramedicine is about engagement into professional practice, ensuring that you are referring people to integrate their care. Um, that is the current and evolving paradigm. So, um, in terms of the uh, end of life discussion, end of life discussions are something that occurs in a paramedic practice very, very frequently. They are usually, however, unplanned no notice, and they are not a sign of a successful health system when they, this is where we have to have the conversation. So at this point, I, I don't have the opportunity to have formed a relationship. I, don't have had the, I haven't had the opportunity to understand the detailed social and medical history of the family and the individual concerned. Um, I am reactive as a paramedic um, in this particular situation and have to make very, very quick decisions whilst um, uh, trying to bring um, calm and hopefully then comfort to the people who we are looking after. It is one of the great challenges of paramedic practice um, to, to these other conversations that we have to have because they have, there hasn't been a preparatory component to um, uh, um, establish um, palliative care options for people ahead of time. Many of the people who I would have end of life discussions in this particular context with, um, uh, I've probably been to more than once. And if I was to poll my colleagues or pull their um, attendance records, that there is a strong likelihood that paramedics have been in attendance to not only this person, but to this family in the months, weeks, and even possibly a year leading up to this critical event. It is unfortunate that previously paramedics have found it difficult to engage with a conversation that would steer someone towards developing um, connection with palliative care service in the community early so that this wasn't an unexpected conversation about end of life, but this was a very different experience, not only for the family, 
but for the attending paramedics when they arrived. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, uh, the internet's been a wonderful thing. It's actually uh, given us many, many images of paramedics doing um, uh, what are reported in the news as amazing things. Um, I, I refer to, I, I just would like to reframe this. This is just being decent humans. And um, it, paramedics are pretty good at being decent humans. Um, it's just that now there's a mechanism by which other people get to see what we've been doing for probably a lot longer than people would realise um, is being decent humans and um, trying to bring kindness and humanity to um, our, the patients that we have interactions with. But the general emergency ambulance experience is limited. General emergency ambulance experience, um, there's an anxiety around end of life care um, uh, with education being limited in some aspects um, for, um, for the paramedic clinicians. There is some anxiety from the practitioner and that is therefore reflected to the provider, uh, to the patient. Um, and uh, so um, the lack of confidence mostly sometimes lack of understanding around symptom management is real and uh, um, was an area that has been targeted. Um, Mark's undersold himself, I must say, quite significantly his impact in Victoria. Um, but it was an area that needed to be addressed um, uh, um, for the elevation of um, uh, the paramedic workforce, which I'll get to in a minute. But this is a non-specialist palliative care service. This is a generalist health clinician trying to do good. This isn't a long-term option. This isn't, um, a, this is insecure in its connection to the community palliative care service. But this is what is available 24-7, 365 across Australasia um, when every other option is exhausted. Paramedic involvement in palliative care through the emergency ambulance space is always going to be that fallback option. So how can we lift up that fallback option such that it's actually um, got a degree of confidence and it reduces the anxiety of the providers um, that we see um, uh, and helps them feel confident in bringing their natural compassion forward? Well, there are now options in some, not all, emergency ambulance services um, for the paramedic management of symptoms around end of life care. The emergency ambulance service is really positioned for dealing with the um, short term crisis event. It's not really well set up for the longer term provision of care in the community. But what it does bring forward now is a, a, a mechanism in the Victorian context for deliberate connection with the local community palliative care service, for the shared um, provision of care um, using telehealth models, for the use of the paramedics as arms and legs and eyes and ears within the patient's home to communicate with the palliative care provider and work with the available medicines that are, are, are may have already been pre-planned uh, with the patient at their home and the available um, medicines and infrastructure within the ambulance environment to, to bring that weight of care to support individuals who are, um, have had sim um, symptoms that have got out of control or have found a need for ongoing advice that they haven't been able to realise another way. They are a connection broker. Paramedics are a, a very good connection broker and this um, uh, ensures that the right option for care can be brought to that patient wherever they happen to be. And in the event that that happens to be a transfer away from their residence or their home, um, because that might be the right answer, um, it not, might not be to an emergency department. It may be direct admission to um, uh, hospice care or something similar, um, if that was um, the, uh, deemed to be the right answer. The challenges, well, everything from the previous slide, we have to build this capacity. The workforce is the demographic that's in front of us. Um, it's building um, uh, not only its experience in palliative care, but it's building its 
confidence and its experience base in, um, in the provision of healthcare in general terms. So have a bit to go. This isn't Andrew, but Andrew has uh, um, joined us today and uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, um, but we have specialists um, uh, in provision of um, paramedic care uh, that are around um, Australasia. Um, and they are in, have done additional education and bring additional skills, knowledge and experience, but mostly bring additional connection, embedded, engaged connection into other, um, into the palliative care services within the jurisdiction they operate in. It is that shared community palliative care experience. It is that known um, uh, understanding of how each other, um, each, each service provider works. It's the ability to do some of the um, uh, longer term planning around symptom management, education, care planning, assessment of need. Um, it is a slightly longer term option in that um, the specialist um, paramedic clinicians that have got an, uh, a palliative care component to them are usually able to spend longer at a scene than um, our general duties emergency ambulance car, um, uh, is able to. It has um, the ability because of those really robust connections into the palliative care services to facilitate logistical, social and environmental supports that might not be possible um, from the general emergency ambulance environment. The value that these specialist paramedic practitioner uh, providers bring um, is a really sound knowledge um, of the nature of palliative care. Um, that supporting um, the individuals in their homes um, and making sure that the broader paramedic workforce understands that this is about chronic disease management. This isn't about um, acute intervention. This is a longer term game, but that you can use some acute interventions to do symptom management and have a really positive impact on the individual um, in their community. Um, and to not overlook um, reversible incidental illnesses. You know, things like urinary tract infections are completely manageable and, um, uh, and need to be um, uh, for everybody's comfort and care. The great um, uh, evolution of these services is um, uh, particularly in um, Canada uh, and the United Kingdom, um, uh, but uh, um, the South Australian Ambulance Service um, has had a very well in, uh, embedded um, extended care program now for many years um, and uh, has uh, is well regarded and uh, um, has got some great published literature that's come out of it. So uh, we're very privileged to have Andrew with us tonight. Then there's paramedic involvement in the um, uh, as a community paramedic where you are not working in the ambulance sector. So these are paramedics who are part of the palliative care team. Um, uh, uh, um, operating out of um, either um, uh, not-for-profit organisations or out of other, uh, out of deliberately out of health services. So this is shared care. It's part of the community palliative care team. This is um, a, a practitioner with a specialty um, dedicated to the provision of palliative care in the community. This is the longer term option. Um, uh, it's part of the community palliative care service. It has the ability to uh, work with uh, um, around logistics and social and environmental supports. It has the ability to establish robust care plans, um, uh, assessments and symptom management, etc. cetera. Um, and the, um, uh, whilst we're slowly starting to see that uh, um, uh, paramedics join the community palliative care team uh, in the Australasian context, um, uh, um, in this particular example, it is clearly out of the United Kingdom um, uh, where this model of care is far more advanced um, and uh, um, the paramedics um, uh, are, are ably prepared um, to be part of the process. Um, so the PEPA program is open to paramedics um, uh, to participate in and we've had paramedics go through that. Um, uh, as a means of, we have paramedics who wish to specialise and really are interested in um, uh, working as part of community palliative care services and doing better, um, uh, even if they can't, even if not, even if they're working within the ambulance or the emergency uh, context, that they want to bring, uh, improve their skills and capability in supporting people and engaging them with their community palliative care services. Um, the um, we need to do better 
um, uh, at, a, at a base level. We need to elevate the base so that we do better um, uh, across the board, um, um, not just try and allow uh, some specific specialisation as part of palliative care services, although we should drive up our capacity um, uh, of our palliative care services um, and uh, um, increase awareness of alternative options. So increasingly the ability to support people in palliative care and uh, end of life care uh, across the spectrum of healthcare um, is possible if we consider how to leverage the opportunities and engage all the different parts of the system effectively. Paramedics are just part of that. So whilst paramedics may not have ever been the first thought, I'd like to try and change the narrative and make sure that they're not always the last thought or the last resort. All right? They can be part of the team to improve palliative care service provision across the health system. All right? um, and to that end, they are a partner. We shouldn't, we're not, I'm not here suggesting that paramedicine will take over the community palliative care service. It's actually not what I'm after. I think that we need to do better when the community palliative care options aren't immediately available and we are sending an emergency ambulance response. And I need to, and I really think that we have a workforce that can join and contribute to being specialists in the provision of palliative care in the community. So thank you, Mark, for the invitation. Thank you all for your attention. And uh, I am uh, most grateful for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for uh, giving such a, a great presentation, painting the sort of broad brushstrokes of history leading up to uh, how things are playing out in Australia at the moment, and I'm sure other jurisdictions, um, but also um, honing in on that increasing ability and interest and desire for paramedics to be looking at broader career, broader um, areas of connection to the healthcare service. And that was certainly a surprise to me that it was only 2018 that um, paramedicine became an APRA qualified um, uh, group in, in Australia, so thank you. Just before we start the panel discussion, just to remind everybody that there is a question function. Um, you may or may not have already seen the ask a question icon. Um, we're going to hold, our next section will go for about 20, 25 minutes and then we'll have an opportunity in the last 20, 25 minutes to answer your specific questions with the panel. Um, and so we'll take those up after the panel discussion, but please put your questions into the ask a question icon on your presentation. That would be great. Thank you. So welcoming to the platform now, Alan's remaining with us, which is great. But we've now got a, a couple of uh, other people, and in fact, Andrew was mentioned in the presentation himself um, as a paramedic from South Australia. He's actually the clinical team lead and extended care paramedic uh, of specialist services within SA South Australia um, Ambulance Services. So welcome, Andrew, to the table or to the, to the conference. Um, and then Brendan Shannon. Um, He's actually connected to Monash University. He's a lecturer, uh, academic within uh, Monash University in the School of Paramedicine, um, and also is still working actively as, as uh, Alan and also obviously and uh, as a paramedic. Um, so welcome to the platform, Brendan. I just thought it might be useful after the presentation to uh, maybe ask both Brendan and Andrew to really sort of maybe reflect on Alan's presentation and maybe if there are any particular key message or key messages that you want to give from your perspective in response to his conversation. Yeah, Andrew, well, I'll, I'll let you go first, mate. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I, I think putting the uh, the paramedic profession in context in the, the, um, the really rapid uh, expansion and um, improvement um, of, of of the paramedicine as a, as a profession, I think, really puts 
uh, the growing work we're doing in palliative care in, in context. Um, it's literally a generation or so ago that, that most paramedics, as, as Alan was alluding to, were, were kind of council workers or volunteers and stuff, and it just wasn't just wasn't feasible. Um, equally, uh, palliative care has grown really, really quickly in, and expanded enormously, even in the 10 or 12 years that I've been uh, working in this space as an extended care paramedic and working with palliative care. Um, Patients have, I've seen patients become more comorbid. Um, uh, the, the range of uh, terminal conditions which palliative care are assisting with has expanded enormously. So I think it's a, it's a really neat conjunction of the, the improvement in, in palliative, uh, oh, the, the expansion of services palliative care uh, offer and the, the um, better equipped paramedics to, to come together and, and meet that. Um, yeah, as, as you said, I, when, when I started, we were uh, pre-hospital clinicians, now we're out of hospital clinicians, this need to go to hospital uh, as a, as a inevitable sort of sequelae of our, of our treatment is not there. So yeah, it's, the opportunities are, are really just opening up in, in front of us. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's an exciting time. Um, but as you said, we've got to be really careful in, in making judicious decisions about what we can do versus what we should do so that there is plenty of unmet need um, and it would be a shocking waste to just create a, a duplication of services rather than an integration of services. But uh, yeah, a, a ton of opportunity in front of us. Mm. I, I agree, Andrew. I think um, uh, my research area is in health services research and nothing bugs me more than when you see services simply being replicated, um, when <coughs> other services that are probably more appropriate um, are better replic would be better suited um, to that. So, and I, I think that's for me reflecting on this um, in the last couple of days about what would be the key messages. And I think Alan stepped on two major points that are really important. Um, the first one is that it's about the value add that paramedics could provide to existing services. Um, we're currently undertaking a project um, around community paramedicine and all the different things happening across the globe in that space and collating all the expert opinion together. And the underlying theme to that has been um, palliative care has come up as being unmet needs within these communities. I'm talking across countries from Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand. There's a central theme about the lack of service provision for that 24 seven hour care is needed, but it can't always be met. And the fallback is the emergency call taking system and then paramedics. So I think that it's about the value that paramedics with specialization could add. And the second part, which is near and dear to my heart is the integration of paramedics within existing um, community palliative care services. So not taking over other people's role, but being another workforce that could help these services to deliver timely care to patients um, that are under their, their provision. So I think that's two major points that I've seen, but um, you know, it's rapidly evolving. Alan's um, taken us from where we started to where we are now, and it's really been in the last 10 to 20 years that we've seen that uptake. So I thought that was two of the most salient points that really hung home to me. Mm. Great, Th thank you. Um, Alan, I'm just wondering, um, you mentioned that, you know, obviously uh, moving beyond the transport option as being the model of care um, and that, that whole integrated care model. I'm just wondering, I mean, who or how do you influence change? Is it, it feels at the moment or it's been a sort of piecemeal sort of process, um, it's gaining momentum, but who fundamentally is going to be the one that will then see this change be enacted sort of more universally across kind of Australia? Does it remain within government? Is it in state? Is it the private sector? Where does, where does that sit? There's a range of different uh, approaches to this one, actually, Mark. So, um, if I was looking, uh, if I was a paramedic working in the, in a uh, public sector environment, so an emergency ambulance environment, um, the, uh, um, then I need partnerships. So I need, uh, um, I need the ability to actually connect my patient um, into the community. And so, if that mechanism or those uh, um, those referral pathways don't exist. Um, then I'm going to find it really, really difficult. So, um, an emergency, the emergency ambulance um, sector is 
really, really keen to engage with primary and community health services at the present moment in time to increase the ability for those connections to exist so that that can occur. Um, the, um, uh, and the, um, if we look at the, the mechanism or the, the way that uh, healthcare, uh, um, uh, hospital based healthcare is going, there's a strong push um, uh, from across not only the Commonwealth and the state funded entities um, the, um, to move care closer to the home and to clo uh, into community, into primary and community health services as well. So the current sort of alignment of where the emergency ambulance sector is, is, is heading is, is well and truly joined up at this point in time with the greater direction. There's more work to do to improve those connections and make them work effectively. Um, but once, um, but I think that uh, we actually have pretty much all the parts of the system hopefully trying to get to the same end goal. Um, our, our health system in Australia being complicated, um, uh, you know, we've just got to overcome that aspect. In terms of working outside of the public sector, so in the, if I was a paramedic working within a community health service or working within a, a primary care facility or um, uh, maybe even working as part of a palliative care team, the, um, the, the challenge in that particular space um, is acceptance um, or um, is opening the door or is um, demonstrating value. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, so if I'm in that environment, then I don't have a transport mechanism. I, I'm already in a, in a non-transport referral environment and uh, it's, um, in the community health space um, uh, where, uh, where a good portion of um, the paramedics who I'm familiar with who are doing, um, who are engaged in providing palliative care services are currently working. Um, uh, uh, they have no transport, for, no, no transport function um, uh, uh, and they are all about their referral um, pathways and connections and um, uh, they find it easier if they're part of a, an established community health service because the health service has referral arrangements that they can leverage as opposed to having to um, uh, to try and find referral options if they work in the public sector. So um, our paramedics that are working outside of the public sector um, at the present moment have actually got better referral options. And I'm, I'm just wondering, Andrew, then in your experience over the number of years, have you seen some of those options come to fruition within South Australia? You seem to be sort of further ahead than most of the other states. And yeah, yeah. I, th I think to, to follow up on what Alan was saying, I think some of the drive uh, that will see paramedicine more involved in palliative care uh, is is also an increased desire by the from the community and from advocacy bodies that there are still uh, people that are sadly dying in hospital that that's not their that's not what they want. They want to die at home, um, and and I think this is where paramedics offer. Uh, uh, an area of specialisation that we're not always aware of ourselves, that, that we have a, a scene awareness, we have an ability to walk into a pretty chaotic system, we never have the home ground advantage, this is every, every paramedic, you know, uh, learns learns these skills to walk into a, a foreign environment with people they've not met, they've not, they have to build a relationship really quickly, um, establish uh, what what is required, what's going on, and and formulate a plan. Um, that uh, ironically is is exactly the same as as most jobs that paramedics do. Uh, just um, uh, transplanted into a into a, a very different mode of care um, because typically we're always working. I, I think of all all clinical care as being either of a of a curative intent or a palliative intent. Now, ironically, emergency paramedics work basically exclusively in the uh, curative intent. You don't go to a vehicle accident and ask someone what is that, what are their goals of care, they want to get out of the car, they want to be saved. Um, it, it, it's, it's, there are differences there that need to be accommodated with education um, because that is quite a thing to get used to. Uh, but yeah, um, as, as the community push for more palliative care in, in the home, I mean, hospices absolutely have a place and hospitals will always have a place, but uh, that's, that's an area that, that will not be treading on anyone's toes that, uh, especially, you know, in, in the middle of the night, we, we bring, as I say, scene awareness, scene safety, uh, scene management, um, governance around moving moving drugs and stuff around in the community, you know, securely and stuff. Um, there's a yeah, there's a, a big place for that. Right. 
Thank you. Um, I guess, uh, Brendan, I'm just wondering, um, and following on from that, I think um, Alan mentioned in one of his slides that sort of increased education standard brings about increased responsibility. And I'm just wondering from your perspective as a teacher, um, what that sort of means to you, but what do, what do you think it sort of means then, I guess, that, the, that increased responsibility that education brings? Hmm. I think as an early career academic uh, transitioning from industry into this space, what I've found is that's different with paramedicine purely because we are still in our infancy compared to other professions such as medicine and nursing is that it's the industry that seems to drive the edge at what is coming from what is being provided in the education and what the industry is pushing is what the community expectations are. So community expectations being pushed through to industry and then industry into the educational system, in this case in the university, where often we find that with well-established research programs that um, it's the other way around, that the education system will push onto industry and and down from that, but I think that gives us a real um, a real point of difference that we're being responsive to community needs, um, and it's interesting because when we see that process from the community up into education via industry, that does bring responsibilities. But Alan even mentioned in his presentation that what paramedics do is ninety percent primary care and ten percent emergency. And we're slowly seeing that shift in education where predominantly our curriculum is based on curative methods. And then I get our students in their final year undergraduate level and flip it on its head and start talking about, um, you know, community-based care and then a palliative care comes into that. Um, and that is a shame that it's not until the last year that we do that. And I'm sure as I train in the next 10 years when I look back and I see the curriculum that we see more integration from the start. Because unfortunately, what we still see is until the, until the students go out and practice clinically, they don't truly see the value because their preconceived ideas of what, what the role is and what they will do is still very much like the community. They're just representative of the community that it's about curative and emergencies. Um, so I think with that, as educators, we have a responsibility to shift the curriculum based off what we're seeing as researchers, um, leaders in our field, to then shift that. So we're starting to shift from just what community industry to, to education to getting on the front foot and now going, right, we're going to educate our paramedic students um, so that when they go out and do their first year and their graduate year, whether that be in an ambulance service or with another alternative service provider, that they're coming out with skills that paramedics 10 years ago have, which we're seeing now around their ability to risk profile patients about who are safe to, to be transported and who are not. Having care and knowledge of how to uh, change a urinary catheter, um, how to care for stoma, things like that. But then importantly in the palliative care space, actually even just understanding what palliative care is. Um, we all know with healthcare professionals, you talk to your colleagues, they think palliative care is purely about end of life measures, which it's certainly not. Um, so I guess that's the responsibility we have of educators um, so that those the next generation coming through are hitting the ground running and not having to just catch up. Um, so that's the responsibility we have. And we do have increased responsibility for our patients when we have increased knowledge, but then that provides better care at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alan, I'm just wondering, you also mentioned in your talk about identity and I, the identity has to shift. The, pe the person who's working in this space has to kind of um, Relook at their own identity. I guess I've seen over many years nurse practitioners who've evolved, you say, in Victoria over the last 15 years, who are now integral into the palliative care environment within um, uh, Victoria and I'm sure in other parts of jurisdictions in Australia. But I'm just wondering how you would see the identity of those paramedics shifting and what, what needs to happen for, those, for the identity to change but also do people recognise that this is an important area of healthcare provision? Absolutely. So um, paramedic identity is largely linked to its historical roots and um, uh, uh, we are starting to see the, um, uh, 
the the evolution of the paramedic identity being away from an emergency ambulance, and um, and that's going to be a really difficult genera um, shift. And I think generation is going to require generational change um, uh, um, to be effective with just within the paramedic community. Um, and so bringing that awareness. Um, Beyond the paramedic community is is is, is going to be a long term game. Um, however, the um, the you know, if you've been working in the emergency ambulance sector for thirty years, you will find it really difficult to understand that there's a another sector where paramedicine could exist. Um, however, it, it is existing um, outside of the emergency ambulance space. It is building a profile. Um, that profile is continuing to grow, um, and uh, um, the opportunities that people are creating um, uh, in using the paramedicine workforce for a range of different healthcare service provision, um, including in the provision of palliative care, is helping to drive that. Um, you mentioned the nurse practitioners. So the, um, the nurse practitioners that I've come across in this space, absolutely sensational. I've learnt an immense amount uh, about um, how what, what the provision of good um, palliative care, uh, end of life care, um, uh, is um, through my contact with them. They are sensational. Um, and uh, the, there is, I just want to revisit that this isn't about replacing anything. Um, uh, I think that the, uh, um, the fallback position when nobody else is available or people are scared out of hours, largely, um, will be the emergency ambulance sector. I'd like to see us improve the capacity of the emergency ambulance sector to respond to those situations, reduce them as far as possible by utilising, um, by increasing the capacity of the community palliative care services so people were less likely to end up in crisis um, uh, requiring unscheduled mm -hmm. symptom management. Um, and if I could see the um, those Community dedicated specialist community services incre increase their capacity, and part of that was um, utilising this uh, a, 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 another workforce, i.e., paramedicine, to partner as part of the, that service delivery. Then that's really good for the emergency ambulance sector. It's also really good because fewer patients in the palliative care uh, pathways are ending up in crisis, um, and. Um, uh, so I think it's a win-win. We increase the capacity of the emergency ambulance sector to, to support these patients if and when they come across them, but we increase the capacity of the palliative care services because we've given them a, another workforce that they could draw upon um, uh, to become specialists in this particular area. Um, that's that's where I'm saying it. It's, uh, um, I'm not suggesting for one second. In fact, the emergency ambulance sector can't absorb any additional work at this point in time, um, uh, um, but we should always strive to do the work that we are called to do to the very best we possibly can. Thank you. And I just wonder, Andrew, yourself, as somebody who's worked clinically in this more emerging sort of field, has identity, your own identity as a paramedic shifted in that time? Yeah, I, I guess it really has. Um, it, it, it's interesting, yeah, we, uh, uh, again, following on from what Alan said, I think, ironically, some of the real stressors on the on the health system are compelling us as a society to take uh, better advantage of these more senior clinicians that we've created that, that work within ambulance services. But, yeah, certainly... Uh, look, I'll put my hand up. When I when I started as a paramedic in, in 1997, I mean, it wasn't all about it, but a big part of it was was racing around and and high high pressure emergency stuff. And um, it, it's only in more recent years that I've reflected that it's it it was and can still be sometimes a very sort of immediate gratification sort of job. Um, you you know resuscitating someone you see a very immediate change um, simply just going to someone with a long bone fracture you you relieve their pain you relieve their anxiety you you start to really fairly immediately solve their problems um, I've found as an extended care paramedic um, uh, it's a much more cerebral job uh, the satisfaction is much more cerebral but um, with with that I think there's a 
there's a, a, a another level of satisfaction. I, ironically, um, it's it's a quite a transition. Uh, so I coordinate the the training of our uh, ECPs, and it's quite a transition to take a senior intensive care paramedic as we do, who's in charge of you know running scenes that were cardiac arrest or horrible car accidents or shootings and stabbings and things, and putting them into a much more low acuity yet high complexity environment. Um, and they are, I think, to a to a person, every single one go into uh, the palliative care area that, that they are moving into with a, a fair degree of trepidation. Um, they are, they're acutely aware that they are not. Uh, they're on, you know, this is very new for them to do anything more than just identify that is a crisis, take it to hospital. Um, but then, ironically, they all find a a, a really deep sense of satisfaction. That you don't get necessarily from a from a good old fashioned stabbing or something um, in in offering someone dignity in offering them um, the ability to to accommodate their wishes you know within South Australia our advanced care directive uh, legislation has also really motivated a lot of change it's, it's empowered people to uh, have more um, uh, Determination over over the outcome of their of their situation, and uh, and whilst it takes a while to get around to the fact that you know it is a it's a life limiting illness that you're managing, and it is going to have an inevitable inevitable outcome. If that can be done with dignity, in particular, um, there it's a um, yeah it's a it's a oddly satisfying element of our work uh, for for someone that was all about. Uh, Studiously avoiding and and fighting off, uh, you know, uh, mortality uh, previously. Thank you. Look, um, I actually that was leading me down a couple of other questions from what you were saying, Andrew. And I, again, uh, thinking about advanced care planning, but also um, thinking about what sat is satisfying about this shift. And and maybe as we wrap up the panel discussion, just to hear from all three of you as to what really kind of keeps this sort of passion. And determination, the, what gives you that satisfaction in the roles that you're participating in, in driving the connections between palliative care and um, paramedicine at the moment, as well as those broader career shifting notions of responsibility. Maybe Alan, you're the you're the go-to person. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mentioned in my presentation about paramedics. Um, uh, they were uh, feeling a little bit anxious about uh, um, dealing with people with primary care. They were just they just defaulted to um, you know, guideline one: be a decent human. Um, and um, the uh, for for me, palliative care um, uh, is not done as well as it could or should be across the community. And um, uh, paramedics have traditionally been the emergency aspect of um, dealing with that. I'd like to. Um, uh, I've, I've been promoting that we need to do better in the unplanned, unscheduled um, uh, um, crisis presentation, usually for symptom management. Um, um, but that's just one aspect of it. Um, and so I think that if we're going to um, uh, be, um, that, that we have a workforce which has evolved and now has the capacity to work with, join with, partner with, and operate in a completely different model. So whether it be as a private parent provider in support of a community palliative care service, these are um, new and evolving opportunities um, to, um, uh, there's um, there's a, one of the comments in the chat, is a really experienced nurse practitioner that's, uh, how, how can I do out of hours work in partnership with a paramedic? Because the community service won't do community won't won't go out out of hours. Um, you know, these are models that absolutely I think we're going to see evolve um, into our future. Um, and it's selling up that uh, there's there is a, a another workforce that is used to working in people's homes. In fact, is more comfortable in people's homes than it is in a clinic. Um, and that'd be the paramedic workforce that uh, I think that we can leverage to improve palliative care. Um, uh, across our community and um, uh, I think the sign of a decent civil society is how we treat people and, um, uh, um, uh, as, as they are moving towards the end of their life and um, uh, this is just one way I think that we can improve that 
um, uh, but it's going to be a collaborative and a partnership model. Thank you. And maybe just from Brendan, um, what sort of drives your passion in this area uh, for change? Mark, I, and I, I've, I've discussed this with you briefly in the past at, on, on, a, on a Pepper uh, course, and I've done some really great jobs that are associated with palliative care and end of life care in particular. But um, I've also done jobs in retrospect where while I've did the best with the system and the situation that I had in front of me, it always racked me with guilt that I don't think I actually provided that person as as much of a dignified death as, as I could have had there been different systems and for myself personally, more specialist knowledge on it. So the most meaningful work that I do isn't necessarily the skills that I provide. It's the, the most meaningful work I do is when I feel like it's had some form of purpose that I've been able to connect someone through with another service or, but not only that, the, the patients that I routinely will follow up on, um, and it's just one of those areas that you go, oh, we could be doing so much more for it. So I could just wait for someone else to do it or I could actually put my best foot forward and start to try and provide research, provide systems so that it is better for those that are, that are coming through. And, you know, the opportunity to do the pepper course and then undertaking pepper placements is um, certainly something that I'm looking forward to do. Thank you. Look, and that's a, a good segue into our uh, questions from the audience today. And um, there's been quite a few comments come into the, the inbox <coughs> just sort of, um, congratulating people on this work and also the work that you're doing and so forth, which is great. Um, but specifically then, there is a comment mentioning about community palliative care teams and working with them. And how would you envisage or are, are you already envisaging how this is going to be happening, how it happens at the moment in that sort of working with. Who'd like to take that? I'll, I'll have a go at that. I, um, uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying blurring the lines of what paramedicine is. While we were just emergency clinicians transporting to hospital, we could be very discreet and, and probably unfortunately uh, had had boundaries around us that weren't really particularly helpful as as we expand so uh you know either a paramedic goes or a nurse or a nurse doctor team goes to someone's home or you know it, it, these are they're very artificial boundaries um i think there's a uh a really a place for uh, the the top the concept keeps coming up but integration um uh, what about a you know a, an extended care paramedic um, nurse practitioner model together? I've a, I've actually had the director of an emergency department say that just in the, in a general emergency department they would they felt that they could absolutely in a in a country centre they could absolutely accommodate uh, an ECP and a nurse practitioner and felt that there would be no overlap at all, which actually surprised me a bit. But yeah. Um, is it, it gets really hard it gets really complicated because the devil's in the detail there's lots of industrial issues there's lots of but there's to respect each other's uh, specialties and benefit from them and integrate them rather than just have them parallel with each other I think yeah. is uh, is a, a, a really exciting opportunity um, yeah great thank you um, any other comments from either of you um, Brendan or Alan okay Good. There's also a call about the, which is central to the current urgent care response is the call centre and triaging. Um, can you talk to the sort of ways in which people can be identified if and when they're on a palliative care program or, or if and when they need palliative care rather than escalations of care maybe in the triaging processes? I'll start. The, um, uh, so I, I'm going to start by saying if uh, somebody's in crisis and rings triple zero um, to access the email service, um, the um, the call taking is um, focused on what is on the emergency component. So it's focused on curative, um, and, and so particularly um, this can be get really gets really challenging around um, people who have um, a defined end of life plan because the call taking is all set up for resuscitation. Um, and driving people towards that. Um, however, once you can get 
the message clearly through that that's not the person's desired wishes, then there is um, uh, the call taking script, script, scripts can shift. It just can be pretty confronting opening gambit, um, uh, that conversation. Um, uh, but um, if a person um, has a um, is in crisis and isn't able to access uh, assistance from their community um, providers, then the ambulance service is always um, going to be a default um, option. Um, and uh, each of the ambulance services around Australasia has different models um, uh, of triage and uh, um, telephone advice um, that are available. Um, and uh, uh, from the information they gather over the telephone through whatever process they use, um, they then target the best resource um, for that person's concern. That might be transferred directly to the community palliative care service after hours if that exists. It might be send an emergency ambulance. It might be send a specialist um, uh, um, uh, paramedic. Um, uh, um, so whatever's whatever makes the most sense and is available within that area to service the need of the individual. Um, uh, and um, uh, so uh, there isn't one straight answer for that particular aspect, unfortunately. Um, the uh, the one thing that can happen though is that no, no matter where the paramedic has come from when they arrive at the home, um, the, uh, they absolutely will want to engage, engage with the uh, community-based or specialist palliative care service if it's available to them. So they will try and make contact with them. This is um, uh, not a we do it this way thing. This is a, okay, there's a plan here for this particular person. All right, let's see if we can follow their care plan. Um, let me see if I can get their treating clinicians on the telephone and do you know work out what what is the best approach um, for the um, um, uh, for this particular individual? Um, they can use medicines that have all in in all jurisdictions. They can use medicines that have already been prescribed for that person um, and have been dispensed to the house. Um, uh, I'm being very particular with my words at this time, um, <laughs> but um, the. Uh, and um, uh, they really do um, uh, aim to engage. So I think there really are some options um, that can come from uh, having, uh, you might end up there by triple zero, um, uh, um, but um, the, the ultimate aim is uh, that the paramedics are providing care in partnership with the community or the specialist palliative care service um, so that it's connected um, and it's appropriate for the, for the person. And, it follows their care plan wherever possible. Great. Um, there's a question also, uh, it talks about that it seems at the moment that it's uh, emergency ambulance services, uh, the palliative care componentry is sort of added on to the current model at the moment. It's a new addition to the skill set. Um, are there other options or other models which have been tried either in Australia or overseas that um, take other approaches or different approaches, maybe where the paramedic is more partnered? Hmm. I think we're uh, in South Australia approaching that. So we're uh, currently rolling out a, a clinical practice guideline for our general emergency workforce in palliative care, but within the Adelaide, broad, very much broader Adelaide metropolitan area, uh, the extended care paramedic team does the, the bulk of uh, the palliative care work, in, in particular that which uh, chooses not to go to hospital. And we have, a, um, I think, a, a really we're proud of the very close relationship we have with the adult palliative care services. Uh, they are central in our training of extended care paramedics and we um, until recently offered exclusively uh, their, provided their after hours um, home visit and assessment um, capacity. Um, it, palliative care is never going to be a large part of the paramedics work and, and it, therein lies one of the challenges is that when you don't do it very often and, and it really is, I think the more you work within palliative care the less you realise what an outlier it is within the broader sort of medical model. Um, because it's not a big bit of paramedics work uh, 
Brendan's right, there's absolutely work to be done on um, improving the education of paramedics because I think a, a foundational amount of uh, education on, on why it's different to a lot of other bits of medicine is, is really important. But sort of a, a hub and spoke model either, as, as Alan was alluding to, either where they can contact back to the palliative care uh, services um, or, or a hub and spoke and spoke model where, where we have a tiered level of advice the paramedic can assess. Um, we're working on a model where they will then contact our extended care paramedics, rotate through our communication centre. So they're always there's always someone that talks paramedic that they can talk to that has a much uh, is much more familiar with with uh, palliative care. Um, again, it, it, it all comes down down to that integration and a, a recognition of of specialties, but also a recognition that this is. It might be an acute episode, but it's an acute episode in typically a very chronic uh, illness, which has a particularly strategic approach to it. Um, yeah, there's, there's certainly more than one way to skin the cat, though. Yeah. yeah. And look, it might lead on to this question, it's actually from somebody who works with a national in-home care provider, so not necessarily a specialist or generalist community-based palliative care. Just asking if you've got any examples of working with people who are in these populations that aren't necessarily connected to particular palliative care services. Are there, um, because as I say, a lot of patients, particularly in residential aged care even, aren't necessarily identified as being palliative or palliative care needs. Um, Anyone like to sort of comment on that or discuss that issue around the, the people who are just in the community who are being cared for by professionals, healthcare professionals, but aren't necessarily connected to healthcare services? Mm. I'll, I'll try to have a stab at this and if Alan, Andrew and even Mark yourself pitch in as, as needed. Um, that question to me really aligns with the experience of what we're seeing with the more established community paramedicine or community paramedic programs internationally, in particular in Canada, um, that are integrated very well. And the, the difference with the community paramedic over the uh, traditional form that we think of with paramedics is that they are, they're proactive out in the community. They're identifying patients that they know have uh, chronic disease. So that these are generally in... It, these paramedics are generally used in small, isolated, rural communities to start with that know their community intimately. They know what the service needs are and also what the lack of service provisions there are. So they're acting essentially as care navigators and finding these patients and then linking them in as needed. So there is examples of this internationally. Um, there are community paramedicine programs propping up with both within ambulance service and outside of ambulance services domestically, but probably not as established as, as the international, um, uh, internationally. In particular, I, I go to Canada because they certainly seem to be leading the way in the purely community aspect of, of, of paramedicine and working in these as care navigators and, and within in-reach and outreach teams and they have really great integration with, um, with, with outside services as well. Thank you. Any other comments? From yeah, just, just on that, I think that, that speaks also to the, the value of uh, initial training. One of the, the, the really central uh, areas, concepts of, of palliative care is identifying the terminal phase of a terminal illness. It's a really, uh, look, I'll be honest, it's a really scary concept. You don't want to get it wrong. You don't mm. want to, uh, yeah. Um, and and um, so we, we find ourselves doing that quite a bit in aged care facilities here in South Australia. They're, they are great at what they do, but what they do is day-to-day -day care. They don't do acute deterioration uh, they're not as familiar with it necessarily, so uh, benefit from assistance. Uh, and again, this is where an ambulance service can commonly provide the sort of a, a rapid response in the matter of minutes rather than hours uh, to to assist these people. And uh, yeah, it's not uncommon that we will identify someone as uh, 
in a terminal phase of a terminal illness and effectively then and there enrol them uh, or, or, or gain assistance from, from palliative care agencies um, and, and or GPs. GPs are also getting pulled into this a lot more. Um, that again, there's all sorts of structural challenges in, in involving them. Um, home visits are just not what they used to be. Um, uh, but uh, uh, again, that's the, uh, the the flexibility of the system will, will accommodate that. Thank you. Um, a, a great question uh, again, that generalist versus specialist role. So we've been talking about moving into a special environment. This is mostly affected medicine, nursing, allied health, and now paramedicine. But the the capacity or the uh, ability to have a sort of generalist kind of approach to palliative care for paramedics should it be a sort of a baseline skill set? I guess. Well, I'd argue yes. That there should be a baseline. There should be some element of baseline, and we 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 cover that in our undergraduate curriculum. Not as much as I would like, but you know things take time. Um, and it's that different aspect of I think there needs to be a, a generalist overview and a good understanding, even just understanding of what palliative care is and what it is not. Um, and then I do believe as time transitions and we uh, we are evolving as 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 a as a registered health profession, that there should be specialist paramedics purely dedicated to palliative care, or at least have that with integrated within their specialist program. We see that uh, intensive care paramedic specialisation, we're seeing community paramedicine and extended care specialists such as such as Andrew, and there should be a significant proponent of that in, in palliative care. Um, so I think that there needs to be both a generalist broad view, uh, and then overall there should be specialist roles as well. Great. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions uh, from one of our... ...doctors in the community used to utilise medications, etc., and take medications, but now it really seems to have become often the role of the paramedic to be able to, to utilise medications um, or go to a home and utilise their medications. Um, is this something they're asking that you're legally able to do this, to utilise prescribed medications in the community for palliative care? I imagine that probably varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but certainly uh, from uh, from a South Australian perspective, uh, our yes, and again, like Alan, I'm going to choose my words carefully because obviously we don't have prescriber numbers. I'm not even sure that we want them, but. Um, uh, yeah, our provision of medication um, falls under the same governance as our provision of any other of any other medication. You know, be it adrenaline for an anaphylactic uh, reaction or or anything else. Um, we we feel that our well, we, we we've chosen that we will carry a a fairly decent. Um, basic range of palliative care medications. Um, thankfully, you can pare it down to about five or so that will will cover the vast majority in, in association with the, the, or the medications that an emergency ambulance would have that we carry as well. Um, there is a finite number that you can provide such that um, because we're often going to a crisis um, and these are sometimes generated as a, as a result of um, a, a lack of anticipation, uh, sometimes entirely understandably, uh, we're not going to let the patient suffer simply because they don't have the medications on scene. Uh, but that is, uh, again, the devil is in the detail uh, because some of these are restricted medications and, and uh, you've got to be very, very careful, responsible and well governed with uh, the management of these medications. But um, I think that's one of the challenges that needs to be addressed um, to, to do this job properly. Right. And just to follow from that, do any of the jurisdictions you know are able to take phone orders then from nurse practitioners or medical officers if the medicines are in the home? Is that something that's available as well to some places? Yeah, we, we, we certainly do that. We'll arrange uh, 
uh, phone orders, especially in aged care facility where, we're, where there are other registered healthcare providers. Uh, as, as a paramedic, I can't provide a phone order, but we have a, a good system whereby, well, I can't provide a medication order. We have a good system whereby uh, we have uh, medicos on, on staff that will provide a, a temporary phone order, or we take advantage of locums to come in and we've got a good relationship with the locum services whereby uh, we won't chew up too much of their time because some of these, the, the assessment uh, and initial management of the patient's quite time consuming, uh, but we'll get them in and then list them to provide the uh, the medication order at times. And the um, uh, each jurisdiction's got some subtle tweaks um, in their poisons regulations, which make this a little bit of an awkward conversation, but the, um, the um, uh, where the medicine, uh, but in all the jurisdictions, where a medicine has been prescribed in advance and dispensed, and um, and there's a you know, a treatment plan within the house, um, then anybody can assist that person with the provision or taking of that medicine. Um, uh, so um, universally, if um, uh, um, if they have already been connected with a great general practice or um, nurse practitioner or a palliative care service and um, uh, um, precautionary medicines have been dispensed um, uh, and there's a plan for how to use those uh, within the house, then the paramedics who are attend are able to follow that plan. Um, uh, and that's, um, that, that applies, um, as of best I understand it, apply that, that aspect, very specific, um, applies across all jurisdictions. So. Right, thank you. Um, just there's a couple of questions in the um, around. Are there any publications on the implementation of, say, the South Australian model um, on on the work, Andrew? I know in Victoria we've got work on the Safe Care Victoria website about the sort of way in which those services can be envisaged between working with palliative care and paramedics. But do you know if there's any sort of publications around this from your point of view? Uh, look, I'll, I'll slightly dodge the question and say that they'd be very limited. Um, and, and this is a real problem, um, well, it, a challenge. Brendan and I were talking about this earlier, that, that uh, if you don't appear in the peer-reviewed literature uh, to an academic, you don't exist. Um, and this is this is one of those um, challenges that we're still uh, overcoming with a really rapidly evolving profession. Um, I'd, I'd take the challenge on just about any other profession to see it evolve at the at the pace that we are, um, and that is an area where we are, to be honest, playing catch up a bit. Um, uh, we, I, I think. The work that we're doing uh, is is ahead of of the way in which it's represented in the literature at this stage. Um, there is uh, uh, an article I'm aware of from the Australian New Zealand Paramedic Medicine Association, I think is it's called, uh, from a, a few years ago. Uh, it's a it's not a peer reviewed article. No, there's there's some work to be done there yet. The, um, there is some some material that's from Canada. Specifically um, around palliative care, quite a lot actually, um, uh, um, and uh, the um, uh, the United Kingdom uh, has some um, very very useful uh, resources around um, paramedics working in the community health space. Um, uh, but if you're looking specifically for paramedic, um, uh, um, including evaluation of service, um, uh, then uh, Canada. Um, is the um, has got the greatest literature base, and I completely agree with Andrew. Um, uh, um, uh, whilst our research base is improving, our um, our publication base has got a way to go to support our evidence. Everyone's too busy doing. Um, <laughs> and not, and not. Um, there's it was only just the in the last week there was a, a systematic review done by Madeline German. I apologise if I've um, mispronounced her name. Um, but that would be a good place to start. Um, yes. So that that should be quite easily found. Just paramedic yes. and palliative care, and be, there'll be there is literature out there, but it is all very early stages. Yeah. Look, one of the interesting things I had from my scoping of a lot of this work was I used the word recognition right at the beginning of the talk today, and it seemed that in most jurisdictions around Australia, in any governmental uh, strategic planning or frameworks to provide palliative and end-of-life care, the recognition of the paramedic role was 
not there. It was invisible. I think I saw one line in one document in in the Tasmanian system. So it feels like there's a long way to go. And you're right, the people that are doing aren't necessarily getting to the table to influence those processes. It's on the way, but uh, for example, I mean, uh, yeah, so when I started in, in 1997, it was a, a diploma effectively um, you know, run within the ambulance service. I've seen it turned into a degree. I've assisted in the construction of a master's degree. It is only really just now that we are breeding our own uh, PhDs. Uh, Madeline's doing a, a PhD candidate at the moment. So, yeah, it's definitely on the way, uh, but more on the cusp at the moment. We, we've got to own that publication ourselves. As a, as a profession. Yeah, thank you. Look, we're getting lots of comments. We're coming to the end of our time. We've had lots of comments just on situations where there has been this collaboration and some of the issues and difficulties. But I just want to mention one here about um, a, a patient who, who died recently and who's uh, the person, thank you for sharing this uh, with us. Um, her husband died from a cerebral bleed subarachnoid hemorrhage and she was the patient was transferred obviously to a metro hospital four and a half hours away and indeed the um, the movement back from the metro hospital back into the rural sector was facilitated with the paramedics while the patient was still intubated to the community setting which was as I said four and a half hours away and then extubated at home with the patient and family back in their home setting. So I think really it sort of gives an example of how things can be facilitated in an appropriate and uh, timely way, even if it's a, a rapid change or shift where this has to be facilitated. So I think there are plenty of examples where um, the effect of, uh, effectiveness of paramedicine and paramedics within the community sector uh, influencing the outcomes of preventable admissions and readmissions and, and necessary discharges is increasingly happening. It seems like you guys, uh, as many others who are most probably online today, are shifting it from being ad hoc and unsystematic to focusing on the systematic and to, to bringing it to be a, a part of uh, most jurisdictions' um, business as usual in the sense of uh, the work that should be expected or anticipated without with good education, good training, but also influencing the structures that frame quality care for the paramedics. So um, with that, I think it's a very timely uh, to thank both or all of you, Alan, Andrew and Brendan, um, to really thank you for your uh, excellent presentations, excellent discussion and particularly from the number of questions and comments we've had in the, uh, in, in the inbox, um, really to say thank you um, to our, our audience for their comments. Um, really just to also add to this that as we come to an end, um, I'll just go back to the slides. Um, we will have a questionnaire, two questions coming up at the end of the presentation today. Um, let me just go to there. Okay. So really to say a, a thank you to our audience. Thank you to Alan, Brendan and Andrew. Um, and uh, there were a couple of exit poll questions will come up on your screens as we finish. So this has been a tremendous afternoon. It's uh, edifying to make the connections and edifying to see the opportunities that exist for all of us in facilitating and bringing this work to fruition. So thank you everybody and um, stay tuned for our next hot topic and uh, our annual lecture coming in, uh, in uh, 12 months time. So thank you. Thanks everyone.